excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning with me and together as a family. And you know, one thing that I really appreciate about that song, wasn't, that, wasn't worship awesome and amazing this morning? The presence of God so good. One of the things I appreciate about that lyric is, is that it acknowledges we need a move. Come on, we need a move of God. Lawrence needs a move of God. I need a move of God. Our nation needs a move of God. But I also appreciate that in that same song it says this is a move. We need a move and this is a move. Come on, it's happening now. It started at the cross of Jesus Christ and it's happening right now. Today is the day of salvation. Amen? Amen. Come on. It's the enemy operates in, in always keeping us thinking that it's some future tense thing that God's going to someday show up and move in our lives. Move in our church, move in our city. Come on, how about we just embrace it? It's happening right now, today, through us and for us. Amen? Come on, if you believe it, put your hands together for Jesus. He's the one that's doing it. He's the one that's doing it. Hey, if you have your Bible this morning, turn to Romans chapter 12 and just be patient. We'll get there here in a moment. And we're going to continue this morning in our series, 10-Year Challenge. And the inspiration for the series was that thing that went viral on social media a while back uh, where people were posting pictures of themselves from today along with a picture from about 10 years ago. And I was watching this go viral and watching my friends and family and celebrities posting these things. And the Holy Spirit just began to speak to me about the reality that 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years from now, your life will look different. We won't be the same that we are today. And that the reality is in every area of our lives, every area of your life, you will be closer to God, further from God, or stuck the same. And I've challenged us and encouraged us that for me and for us as a church family, there's really only one acceptable outcome. That in every area of, of our life, everything God's called us to do, everything he's made possible for us to be, everything he's invited us to put our hands to, that, that we would press in, that we would prioritize, that we would pursue God in such a way that we would be more aware, more connected, closer, deeper to God's plan, God's heart, God's purposes, God's will, God's word, God's way in every area of our life. Come on, that's the invitation of God to you and to me. Amen? Amen. And so before I get into the word this morning, every morning or every Sunday before we get into the message, we've taken a moment and we've just enjoyed looking at 10-year challenge photos from someone in our church. And this morning, I have the, the privilege of showing you some pictures of someone that's very near and dear to me and is becoming, I believe, near and dear to you. And that's Fernando Alvarez, who was leading our worship team this morning right here. Where is Fernando? Fernando, where are you at, man? Is he, is he back in here yet? Where's he at? There he is right there. So there's Fernando. Uh, that's, a, that's relatively present tense right there. That's, that's, that's in the halls of Rev City. We've got a few more pictures to show of Fernando. He was so kind and considered to share some pictures. There's him interacting with our team in, the, in recent months. The, that's the first time. That's the first time that Fernando was here. So that would actually be, oh, I see Caleb Heap up there. That, that must have been... Uh, Activate Conference 2016, is that right? Yeah. Moving on there. 2017, January of 2017. There's Fernando and his dad and his brother. Come on, those are three handsome men right there, right? <laughs> Fernando with his family. Come on, aren't they a beautiful family? Who can spot Fernando? <laughs> You're the one in the back. Ah, there he is, right there. <laughs> Who got it right? There's Fernando leading worship on the platform in front of the capital of the United States of America. Listen, can I tell you, I, I wanted to, to, uh, to lead us through looking at these images because I, I, I felt like I wanted to speak about some of these things in a way that I knew Fernando wouldn't because he just wouldn't. He walks in humility and boldness. But that's Fernando leading worship in front of the capital of the United States of America when he was the, the worship leader for Lou Engle and The Call, which is a massive movement that has impacted our country. And so Fernando uh, is, is a blessing to the body of Christ, and we are blessed to not just know him but to have him here uh, serving our church and leading our, our church family in worship. 
moving on there. there yeah, come on. That's, that's a good thing to respond to. Listen, one thing I appreciate about Fernando, he, he, has, he, could have, he has a lot of invitations from places that are maybe currently present tense. Maybe would just uh, be a little bit more lucrative for him to be bigger crowds, bigger churches, bigger honorariums than what we're able to do. I mean, I'm just telling you, there's some other invitations that he could re be responding to, but he is being obedient to come and serve at Rev City Church in Lawrence, Kansas. And right there, you can see him serving in a, on a big platform. And <laughs> Fernando leading worship at Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. So, you know, we, we are, uh, we're so blessed. And I just can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I believe that the Lord began doing something um, in the fall of last year. He just began to speak to me about just the trajectory of our church and some things he wanted to do, specifically in the area of praise and worship. How do you know that, that experiencing and encountering the presence of God through praise and worship is an important part of our faith as a believer. It's important. And come on, even without Fernando here, how many know we have an amazing team that God's assembling here? But I believe that we're just scratching the surface of what God wants to do from this church family as it regards praise and worship. I believe there's a new sound. I believe there are new melodies. I believe there are new new songs that God wants to birth, that God wants to, to write, that God wants to inspire, inspire as we just keep and put him first and as we seek his face. You know, I think it's prophetic that, that, that God's expanding this platform. God's expanding this stage. In the natural, it's just a little, few more feet of platform space so that we could uh, put these subwoofers under the stage instead of out in front of them like they've been for many years. And there's some practical things. But I think prophetically, God's expanding the platform of this church so the other, so the other young leaders and other uh, old leaders and other leaders who are striving to remain young <laughs> can be equipped and released into the calling that they have for their life. Amen? That's, that's a big part of Fernando's heart. For years and years, he's led a, a, a Rendered Heart Institute where he's gathered worship leaders of all ages, I'm sure, trained them up and equipped them and empowered them and strengthened them and sent them back into their churches and ministries to, to lead worship. So he, I, I love Fernando. I love his heart for worship. He's, 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 he's developed the gift that God has put in him, and God's put him in some places to have influence in the body of Christ, and we're blessed to have him here leading worship for us. He's going to be here at least two or three times a month all throughout the year of 2019, leading worship and parting and releasing things to our team, training them up to become the best version of what God's called them to be as it regards leading worship in this place. And then we're just praying about what God would have for the bigger picture. But I asked Fernando if he'd be willing to come and just share for a moment or two about his heart for the Lord and for praise and worship and for Rev City Church. Come on, would you put your hands together for Fernando Alvarez? <laughs> Love you, bro. We have the best, we have the best pastors, Pastor Thomas and Amity. So we're connected. That's right. We've been connected for a while. I'm really close with uh, his parents, Pastor Richard, Peggy, Humphreys. Uh, I've been to their church as well when they were in Abilene. And uh, it's incredible because we're connected with Larry Titus as well. So it's, me and Thomas had this conversation about following, you know, family trees, but also the, the genealogies of spiritual family trees. You think about the people that mentored you and the people that fathered you, and you begin to see all these people that, oh, this person came out of this person, this person came out of this person, and all of a sudden, your roads just begin to just to cross. And it's I true. feel like our roads are crossed, Thomas and Abedi, uh, for such a time as this. And it's a privilege to be here at Rev City serving uh, in every capacity. And I just, I like, like Pastor Thomas says, we already have an incredible worship team, and I believe that what God's called this church to do is something beyond what our comprehension, what, what we, we can actually believe in, what we can see with our natural eye. At the beginning of this year, uh, the Lord took me to a story in the Bible of Jethro and Moses. Jethro is the father-in-law of Moses, and he saw Moses' huge burden for 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 bringing deliverance into the people of Israel. He had to go and deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt. And he says, man, this, this thing is going to be so big for you. You can't do it by yourself. And he says, I suggest you find men. And you appoint them. And you put your spirit in them. You place your DNA in them so that they can do the work that God's called you to do. And I feel like in this journey of my life, I, me personally speaking, you know, God has just really just 
allowed me to see so many things. But I feel like I'm in a place where I'm like, man, Lord, I just got to give everything away. Yeah. Everything that you've showed me, everything, and, 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 and give me more. Give me a fresh oil. And I also, my, I'm in a new season. I said, Lord, this is a blank canvas, God. Give me fresh oil for this next season. Lord, I, I really want, I want to do whatever you call me to do. And I believe this is in a season where we're going to see so many leaders rise up in our team. There's going to be an expansion in our worship team. And I think it's such a privilege because God is definitely doing a new thing here. And I, I just want to just thank uh, you guys, you mm -hmm. all, Lawrence, Rev City, making room for this Latino man <laughs> from Texas. And... Uh, I am expecting dinners and lunches from you guys. <laughs> Invite me. Work for food, you know? And so I love you guys. Thank you so much. Hey, come on, give it up for him. Hey, love you, bro. <clears throat> so today, right after the service, right in the fellowship hall, just right out those double doors, right there behind Terry Larson. Hey, Terry Larson. Uh, we'll have a reception for Fernando, just a brief meet and greet. But can I encourage you, make a moment. Take a moment, go through there and just shake Fernando's hand, welcome him, thank him for answering the call and just encourage him with the way that maybe he's already been a blessing in your life. Even this morning, you know, just the way that he was just helping our worship team to lean in, to, to apprehend, to hear, to discern, and to obey and respond to what the Holy Spirit was doing during our worship time this morning. And so just take a moment, would you take a moment, we got some cookies and some, some punch or lemonade or something over there, just swing through there, meet and greet him, and uh, I know you'll be blessed, Amen. All right, 10-year challenge, continuing a 10-year challenge, and uh, the idea, the heart behind this series is that you will be different 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years from now, that God has a vision for your life. God, there's a hope, there's a future, there are plans, there are purposes according to Jeremiah 29, and they're good plans. God, God calls you to have a vision. He calls us to have a vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, it's with, without a vision, people perish. Another translation says, people cast off restraint. And what it means is that without something that we're living towards and we're living for, God's dream, God's goal, God's idea for our life, the thing that he's leading and calling us to be and become as men and women, as, 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 as husbands and wives, as, as servant leaders in our church and our community, that without that vision, it says the people cast off restraint. In other words, when you have something that God's leading you to, something he's shown you, who you're called to be, what your marriage can become, it causes you to begin to live differently. It causes you to begin to ask God, order my steps so that I can pursue and become, that I can get to that destination, that I can cross over into those promises. And I've said it this way all throughout the series, that the pathway to God's vision for your life is paved with daily decision. The pathway to your vision is paved with daily decision. And our decisions that I'm challenging you and encouraging you and championing to you in this season is to prioritize God, to pursue God to in a new way, in a fresh way, ask God, present yourself before God and say, God, who are you calling me to be? Who are you calling me to become? Because oftentimes we set do goals. We tend to set do goals, things I want to do, an amount of money that I want to make, something that I want to build. Those are all fine. Those are all good. But I think, you know, it, studies show 90% by this time of the year, 90% of resolutions about things that we'll do have fall, fallen by the wayside. And so we're frustrated but I think we would be better served if we would present ourselves before God and we would get in God's word and we would say, God, instead of setting do goals, how about I set some who goals? Who you've called me to be. What you want to do in my heart as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a servant leader, Lord. I want to become, listen, if, we, if we'll become the people that God's called us to become, we will begin to do the things that he's called us to do. Amen? So the pathway to your life vision that God wants you to have so that he can begin to order your steps, that you might be able to, to begin to live purposely and with intent is, is paved with daily decision. And so I asked the Lord, we're beginning to shift, we're starting to ramp this series down. I said, Lord, what would be some practical things that I could begin to challenge the church with that are key things, significant things, that if we begin to focus on these things, it will prepare us and equip us to begin to live out this thing, to begin to make progress towards the thing that you've put in our heart, the dream that you have for our life, our home, our marriage, our church, our city. And he, he spoke several things to me. He said, you know what? Uh, uh, the life you lead is, is largely comprised by the thoughts you think, by the words you speak, and by the company you keep. Let me say it again. The life you lead is largely comprised by the thoughts you think, the words you speak, and the company that you keep. And so I want to talk to you this morning about 
the thoughts you think. The thoughts you think. Are you there, Romans chapter 12? It's been a key uh, uh, scripture for this series. And starting in verse 2, it says it this way. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Come on, say it this morning. Don't be conformed. Be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. How are we transformed? By the renewing of our minds. And it says then... When? When we, when we break free of the patterns and the ways of the world and we begin to allow God to renew our mind with his word and his heart, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and perfect will. Let me encourage you. There's a pattern right there. If you're kind of struggling, like, God, what do you have for me? What are you calling me to, to do? What are you calling me to, to be and become? Start with this. Begin to ask God, Lord, show me the ways that I can begin to break free from some of the patterns of the world and begin to present my body a living sacrifice, which is my good and reasonable worship for you. And begin to allow you in your presence to begin to renew my mind and transform the way that I think so that I can become the man or the woman of God that you've called me to be. Listen, this is important. This is important. If we want to discover, if we want to not just discover, but begin to experience the will of God for our lives, we must break free of the way that the world lives and the way that the world thinks. Amen. Listen, we're saved by grace, and somebody give a good amen. amen. But we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Renew, I looked it up, it says to give fresh life. This is a definition. To give fresh life or strength to something. To replace something that is worn out or broken. This is important. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And listen, who we really are, not who we want to become, not, to, not who we think we are, but who we really are is the sum total of our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And listen, thoughts are important. Thoughts are important. Thoughts inspire words. Thoughts inspire words. Come on, men. That word that you just said to your wife that you wish you could reel back in, it started as a thought. And James says that it's difficult. Who can bridle the tongue? But the Bible's very clear that we can begin to take captive our thoughts. So maybe we ought to back it up a step and begin to say, God, help me to begin to renew my mind. Help me to begin to be transformed in my mind so that that thing that I said that I wish I could reel in. Come on, who's, who, is that just me? Some of you, are, I, I was expecting a better response than that. Have you ever said something and as it was coming out of your mouth, you realize this is trouble? I wish I could reel that thing back in. I mean, you know what I mean? Like you're saying it and it's like the whole scene just switches and it becomes like a slow motion military movie. Like the words coming out and you're just like, you see the word hitting her ears and you're like, no. You know, and you see her like the word, the, the, the word that she just said hitting her, you know, and she goes like this, and she recoils, and then you see her. <laughs> that word was a thought. And it's tough to bridle the tongue, but God's word is clear. We can take captive our thoughts. Thoughts are important. Your thoughts inspire words. Your words inspire action. Actions inspire habits. Habits shape your character, and character is connected to your destiny. It's really true. Every word and every action is first conceived as a thought. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're saved by grace, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is important. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He, I've heard it said this way, your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Listen, it's impossible, it's impossible, it's impossible to live a life of victory with a mindset of defeat. It's impossible to live a life of faith with a mind that's gripped by fear. It's impossible to walk in the fullness of God's abundant provision for you with a mindset that's gripped by poverty. It's impossible to fully enjoy a relationship with God and with the people of God and with your spouse and with your family. It's impossible to, to, to enjoy the fullness of those things with a mindset that's gripped by insignificance, inferiority, and rejection. 
Listen, some of you this morning, you're feeling held back. You're, you're, you're feeling held off. You're feeling held up. You're feeling held hostage. And I've got good news for you this morning. It's, it's a lie from the enemy. You are not really what the enemy is saying that you are. You are not insignificant. You are not unworthy. You are not inferior. You just have a mental stronghold. A lie from the enemy that's operating on your mind. Some of us today that are feeling held up and held back and, and held hostage, all we really need to begin to begin moving forward and breaking free is a checkup from the neck up. Come on, touch three people and say, you might need a checkup from the neck up. Come on, come on. That might be all that's holding you back today. Listen, the good news is we all need a checkup from the neck up. I don't know that there's any person that doesn't have some level, some place where the enemy has lied to you. And where maybe in some way, some form, some fashion, you believe the lie. Here's the other good news. This is the other good news, that, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful medicine for a broken mind. I think it's interesting that right from the start, Jesus, you know where he was crucified was a place called Golgotha. Who knows that? Come on. You remember he was crucified on a hill called Golgotha. You know what that means? It means place of the skull. Right from the start. Listen, I, I mean, this whole book is just a tapestry of prophetic. Just It's all intertwined. It's all tied together. Nothing, nothing is wasted. Nothing happened by, happens by accident. He was crucified on the place called Golgotha, place of the skull. I think right from the start, he was saying, listen, I'm shedding my blood to come and make a way that they might begin to think a little bit differently about God, about life, about their future. This whole book is Jesus. The Bible says that he was the word in the beginning. The word became flesh. Not just the red letters, everything that it says. The place where it says that you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, those are the words that were inspired by the spirit of Jesus. And he was, he was crucified on the place of the skull, Golgotha, to begin to renew right from the start. He was saying, I'm coming and I'm making a way that they can begin transformed because they're going to begin to be able to relate to God differently. Not through a system of religious sacrifices, but through the price of my shed blood that once and for all is going to pay the price and pave the way for you to have a relationship with a good God who has a plan, who has a hope, who has a future for you, for your marriage, for your family, for the city, for the church, for our nation. And somebody should say amen. Listen, listen, you are equipped. We are equipped to win the war in our minds. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Come on, who still brings a paper Bible to church in here? Let me see your hand. Oh, come on, man. I love it. It's right here, Ray. <laughs> but I got to say, I'm using my phone more and more and more and more and more and more. It's convenient. Hey, it's still the word of God, however it comes to you, you know. I was kind of just curious to see how many people I need to give a little bit more time to kind of like go back to the front and look at the index and find out what page that it's on. <laughs> I like the people that just sell out to it. I don't know where that's at. I'm just going to put these big, giant plastic things on the outside of my pages that are color-coded and all these things, you know. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5. Listen, you're equipped to win the battle in your mind. We are equipped to win the battle, the war that wages in our mind, and there is a battle. Here's what it says. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For our weapons, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It means they're not of this world. It's not the weapons that the, war, that the world fights with. But they are mighty in God. Somebody say mighty in God. Mighty. For pulling down strongholds. Somebody say strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalt, exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It says strongholds. That, that word in the Greek is a horama. And it means literally a fortress of walls. And, and this is associated, that strongholds and mindsets are associated in that scripture. That our, our weapons are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds, taking captive of thoughts and things that, that, that exalt themselves against who God is and what he's told us and what he's said about, about who you are and what's possible for you through him. And then it says, take captive, 
take captive, take captive every thought. But stronghold is a fortress of walls. And listen, many of us at some point in some way have been held captive by a lie. A wall, a lie that the enemy introduced that became a stronghold, a fortress, a wall in our life that was holding us back and keeping us from moving forward towards God's plan and purpose for our life. Some of you, you're, you're, you're being held captive by a, a door that you think is locked, but really it's a lie. And you know, they say that at a certain point, prisoners begin to just accept that the door of their prison cell is locked. Maybe for the first few days or few weeks or few months, and maybe if you're really resilient, maybe even for a few years, you kind of get up at, when they lock you in for the night and you go over and you kind of rattle the door a little bit. But at some point, your hope begins to begin deferred and your heart begins to get sick and they, you hear the door slam shut and you just lay in your bed. And you assume that door's locked, I've checked it, I've tried it before. I'm telling you, when Jesus came to Golgotha and he shed his blood and he gave his life and he made a way, he gave us the keys of victory to win the battle over our mind. Amen. That door has been swung open and swung free, but the enemy stands there and he tries to convince you that you must stay behind it. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I think there's somebody in this place where there's a mental stronghold, there's a lie from the enemy that, God, that the enemy has come and he's, he's built around your, your mind. He's built around your heart. He's built around your marriage. He's built around your ability to begin to move forward towards the purposes of God for your life. And I'm telling you today that God is delivering you. He's reminding you that he gave you the keys. He's given you the authority and he's given you the weapons of our warfare to win this battle. What mindset is holding you back? Come on, this is not a rhetorical question. I really want you right there where you're sitting this morning, just ask yourself, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what mindset is maybe holding me back? What wall has the enemy come and built in my mind that's holding me back and, and keeping me from moving forward, keeping me from breaking uh, free and keeping me from running towards the call of God upon my life? Come on, that wall today must fall. That wall must fall. That wall must fall. Come on, you ought to say it this morning. That wall, that wall. must fall. Come on, say it again. That wall must fall. Listen, there are walls coming down in this place. Around here, they're using hammers and saws and things like that. Before they can begin to build up the thing that, that, that's on the plans, before they can begin to, 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 to build the, the new thing, there's some old things that are coming down. And for some of us, there's some, there's some things, there's some walls that need to come down. God's got a plan. He's got a future. He's got a hope. But there's some walls. There's some strongholds that'll hold you back and keep you from experiencing it. That wall must fall. Ephesians chapter 6, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. That word, while you're turning there, that, that word, take captive every thought, captive into the obedience of Christ. It's a military term, and it means to hold captive at the tip of a spear or sword. It means to hold captive. You can just envision like a prison guard holding someone captive or a military person holding someone captive against a wall with the tip of a spear or the, or the edge of a sword. Ephesians chapter 6 shows us that we have a weapon to win this war. And it says in verse 14, it says, stand firm then. Come on, somebody say stand firm. Amen. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness firmly in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation upon your mind and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Most of them are defensive weapons, but the word of God is an offensive weapon. I love what I heard yesterday in the marriage conference. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. There's one side of it that is, that is, sh that is sharp and is able to, to, to wield off the enemy, and there's another side of it that's able to, to pierce, like the word of God says, between marrow and joint and begin to get into you and begin to do surgery and operate on some of those places where those thoughts, where those words, where those things that have been done to you have rooted themselves into you and become mindsets. We have a weapon that enables us to win this war. It's the sword of the spirit. It's the very word of God. And come on, whether you bring the old school paper version, King James version, or whether you're reading the message on your Bible, on your phone rather this morning, the word of God is powerful. It's alive, it's active. It's able to do what God sent it to do. Take captive to the obedience of Christ. Listen, I, I started praying about this and thinking about this. To the obedience of Christ, and I started to just realize, like, the obedience of Christ was crucifixion 
in the midst of a reality of an option that would feel better to his flesh. You guys know that? Jesus, the Bible talks about he could have called down angels from heaven. He, he, he could have, he, he, had a, he had an option out. But he, the obedience of Christ, taking, taking captivity to the obedience of Christ is to the point of crucifixion in the midst of an option that feels better to your flesh. Listen, I don't get it, I don't understand it, but I think some of us, we become comfortable with some of these mindsets, some of these strongholds. And we allow them to remain on life support in our life. We allow them to exist and continue to affect us. When, when the word of God says, take it captive to the point of obedience in Christ, which is crucifixion. Come on, that wall doesn't just need to fall, that thing is just die, needs to die. Don't leave it on life support. Don't leave it hanging on by a thread. The obedience of Christ is crucifixion, even when there's an alternative that feels better to your flesh. And I don't get it, but we get comfortable with some things that in reality are bondage. Come on, think about it. The people of Israel, they cried out to God, save us, deliver us. And just a few miles down the road, they were already saying, can't we go back to Egypt? At least there we were comfortable. At least there we had three square meals. At least there we had a, a bed. It might have been concrete, but at least there behind our cell we were provided for. What, what, Lord, what are you doing in my life? We can become comfortable with something that's really bondage. Today, I think the Spirit of God desires, he longs to begin to show you those mindsets, those strongholds, those mental blocks, those bondages. What mindset have you allowed to live that God is calling you to pick up today the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and begin to finish it once for all. To take captive, to say, that thought of inferiority, I'm taking it captive with the sword of the Spirit. The enemy is speaking to me that I'm insignificant, that I don't belong, that I don't matter, and I'm taking the Word of God which says that I'm adopted, that, I'm, that I was chosen, that Jesus paid a high price for, to make me part of the family of God, children of God, that's the, that's the truth. And I'm taking that word, and I'm taking captive that thought of in inferiority and insignificance. Take captive. Listen, once taken captive, you have to replace that thought with the higher thought. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says this, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Listen, you got to replace the thought with the higher thought. In that place where there's currently that thought, that mental stronghold, that mental block, you gotta go into God's word. You gotta get with God. You gotta call your pastor. You gotta get in a life group. You gotta find the way. You gotta find the person. Say, what's God's word say about this? Because many of us, we just spend all of our time just trying to just kind of contain or control or medicate a stronghold. You can't do it. You gotta replace it with a higher thought. Come on, right now. I want you to just start thinking of a purple cat. Purple cat. Think of a purple cat. Are you thinking of, some of you hate thinking of purple cats. Some of you love it. Purple cat, think of a purple cat. Keep thinking, purple cat. Who's got a good image of a purple cat in their mind, huh? Come on, play with, play, uh, work with me this morning. Who's got an image of a purple cat in your mind? All right, stop thinking of a purple cat. Stop it. Stop thinking of a purple cat. Stop it. Stop thinking of a purple cat. But now I want you to think of a blue hawk. You see what I did there? Think of a blue hawk, blue hawk, blue hawk, blue hawk. Think of a blue hawk. Think of a blue hawk. You're thinking of a blue hawk. You're not thinking of a purple cat. You got to replace a thought with a higher thought. Oh, I didn't mean to imply anything right there. I did. <laughs> oh, man. I honestly did not intend to imply that, but that was pretty funny. <laughs> replace a thought with a higher thought. Listen, sometimes we can't control the birds that fly by. Hear this, sometimes we can't control the birds that fly by, but we have everything to say about the ones that make a nest. We have everything to say about the ones that, that make a nest. The enemy's gonna come, he's gonna lie, he's gonna try to deceive you and your mind. And sometimes we don't have any control over what, the, what people say and what, what, what the enemy's lying to us about, just like a bird. But we don't have control of the bird that tries to fly by, but we have every opportunity to shoo that bird off and say, you're not making a nest in this mind. I'm taking you captive, and I'm replacing that thought with the higher thought, the word of God for my life.
You know, science has, has even proven this to be true. Just a few decades ago, they thought that your mind was pretty much kind of formed when you reached a certain age. But they've discovered that you, your mind is constantly being renewed. There are constantly new things that are developing in your mind, new mindsets, new patterns. They, they call it neuroplasticity. You could go look it up. I, I found it on the internet. It has to be true. They call it neuroplasticity. And when you have a thought, your mind, you know, it, how does it work? I mean, I, I have a thought and I begin to remember it and consider it and it begins to affect me. Physiologically, in your mind, your brain begins to lay down tracks. And they, they say, scientists say that on average, about seven days is how long it takes for the track to become complete where a thought becomes a memory. And then they say it's about 68 days. I don't know how they, how they figured that out, but 68 days when that thing becomes fully formed. In other words, it becomes a habit. It becomes a mindset. It becomes a stronghold. That thing is fully formed. Listen, you, 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 you're, this is good news if you're thinking good thoughts. This is good news if you're getting in the Word of God and finding out what God has to say about you. It's not so good news if you're listening to and believing the lie. But the good news is you really can teach an old dog to do new tricks. You really can reprogram your mind. You really can begin to renew your mind. Not that I needed science to prove the word of God, but it does it all the time, amen? He's saying you could be transformed, made new by the renewing of your mind. Some old thoughts, some old patterns beginning to be replaced with a higher thought, a higher pattern, a higher way. My ways, says the Lord. We can't control the birds that fly by, but we can control which ones take up nests in our, in our mind. Fix your thoughts, fix your thoughts. Philippians 4 says this in verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Come on, say, think about what you're thinking about. It's time to think about what we're thinking about. What are you thinking about? What's the mindset? What's the thing that's holding you back today? Come on, can I ask our worship team to just rest of our worship team to come forward and prepare to lead us and our response today. You know, I, I think that there's, I've got several of them here in my notes, but I think the main one is when you have a thought, when that bird flutters into your mind, to just ask yourself this question, is this faith or fear? Is this thought strengthening my faith? Is th does this thought rooted and grounded in faith? Does this thought, is this thought leading me to have an expectation that God is gonna show up on the scene? Or is this thought tied to fear, the fear that God won't show up, the fear of cancer, the fear of early death, the fear of rejection from a spouse, the, the fear that the, that, that, that the baby won't make it to term, the fear of, of, of isolation or rejection, all those things. And just begin to pass it through that filter. Say, Lord, is this fear or is this faith? Because the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? But of what? Of power and of love and of what? Sound mind. Anything that's tied to fear, anything that's not tied to faith, anything that's tied, come on. You, the Bible talks about meditating. That doesn't belong to the new age. That belongs to our God. And the new age has nothing on the ancient of days. He says, meditate upon my word. Day and night, meditate upon my word. Come on, put that scripture up there from Isaiah. Isaiah, meditate on my word. You guys have it? Do I have it? <laughs> Did I give it to you? <laughs> Joshua, it's Joshua chapter one. Verse 8, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So, ah, I don't know about that. Listen, you're meditating on something. When you wake up in the middle of the night and you got circumstances, you got problems, we all do, you're meditating about something. Is what you're meditating on God showing up to do what he does, rescue, restore, redeem, renew, revive? Or is what you're meditating on an outcome where God doesn't do his part, where he doesn't show up, where he's not faithful, where the enemy comes and, and steals the day? Is it faith or is it fear? Listen, church, stand to your feet, stand to your feet.
This is important. Your, your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. There's a war, there's a battle in your mind. We are saved by grace in Jesus Christ, but we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. He's given us the weapons of warfare, the sword of the spirit, the word of God to combat this thing and to take it captive, those thoughts that the enemy comes to try to bring those strongholds, those walled fortresses to hold us in and keep us back. So Lord, would you just show us? Come on, I said it earlier, I think every person in some way, some place, some relationship, something that God's called you to, there's, a, there's some level of a stronghold. I believe that God wants to begin to highlight those things. Listen, when God reveals something, it's because he wants to heal something. The enemy is the one that operates in condemnation. But the Holy Spirit operates in conviction, and the Holy Spirit comes and shines a light of a loving father who says, my child, it's been too long. This thing's been holding you back. It's a lie. It's a deception. I've opened, I've given you the key. The door is open. Fling it, fling it open and run. Begin to run with me. Just, just right there where you are, just ask the Lord. Just ask the Lord. Lord, where, where is there a stronghold? Some of you, maybe you become so comfortable with it, like I was saying earlier, so comfortable with it that it's going to take a moment for you to really even realize where that thing is, that stronghold, that place where you haven't trusted God to provide. That place where you really have had fear of whatever it is, untimely death or rejection from a friend or a loved one. Maybe it's even been insignificant and it's even kept you from connecting strongly to a, to a church family because you just feel like, who, why would they need me or want me? I'm insignificant, I'm in fear. I'm telling you, that's a lie from the enemy. You are significant. There's a call, there's a grace, there's something that God's done in your life. There's a testimony. This church needs you. God's called you. You're not insignificant, you're not inferior. Maybe it's a, God's, it's, it's, it's a fear of inability for God to provide financially. It's holding you back maybe from even getting married or from a desire to have kids. It's, that's a lie of the enemy. God will provide. God will provide. Thank you, Lord. Just show us, Lord, where are those strongholds? And now I want us to sing this song, and I want you to trust that God's going to begin to come, and by his power, because of his great love, he's going to begin to come, and he's going to begin to tear down those walls. And he's going to begin, by his spirit, to begin to speak, to begin to remind, to begin to reveal you of a to begin to reveal to you a better word, his word, his heart for that situation.